um, a big part of the reason I came to Mount Sinai is because of the expertise in mesothelioma. This is one of the few institutions where we see this disease and treat this disease, in particular treat it with surgery, uh, much of which is because of Dr. Flores's current work. But as you'll see through this talk, there is a great deal of historical interest in both this disease and the surgical treatment of it at this institution. That's not going to work. Sorry. Dr. Marin, do you, do you have a pointer? Thank you. So as many people in this audience know, malignant pleural mesothelioma is a disease of the lining of the chest. It is best known for its association with asbestos. And that discovery was made here at Mount Sinai by Dr. Selikoff. There are approximately 3,000 cases annually seen in the United States. Mm -hmm. Most of those are women. I mean, most of those are men. Sorry, the uh, autoplay distracted me. In fact, only about 20% of patients presenting with mesothelioma are women. Just as uh, pictures help keep residents awake, uh, I think James Lim knows these pictures. Here is the normal chest. The real test is, can I use the laser pointer? In early stage mesothelioma, we see a disease of the parietal pleura. As you recall from medical school, the lining of the chest wall, sometimes the diaphragmatic surface, as well as the pericardial surface. But this is still pleural-based disease in this picture, at least. In more advanced stages, it progresses to involve the visceral pleura, or the lining of the lung itself and as it advances even into the fissures, can invade the diaphragm and even trap the lung and invade the chest wall. This is a locally invasive disease. It's a little different than many of the solid cancers we treat in that its propensity to metastasize is actually fairly low. We rarely see this to the extent that when we're evaluating these patients preoperatively, if we see other lesions on a PET CT, they are more likely to be other cancers and or benign than metastatic disease. 30 years ago, this was a uniformly fatal disease. You can see here the median survival for patients treated with surgery in this series from 1976 was six months. So people who were diagnosed with this disease were told to get their affairs in order and prepare to die. But we've come a long way, and that's one of the major uh, pieces I want you to take home from this talk, that advances in the techniques of surgery in particular, as well as radiation therapy and new forms of chemotherapy, particularly doublet chemotherapy with uh, pemetrexid and platinum, have enabled long-term survival in this disease. So where do we stand currently? This is, at this point, a few years old. In 2010, I looked at every series in the literature published on mesothelioma, 131 studies uh, from 1982, rather, to 2010. So some of those earlier studies uh, were not included, including series describing palliative treatment, representing thoracentesis, pleurex or uh, pleuridesis, chemotherapy, and surgery-based trials. This is not to look at, but more to show you the sheer size of the number of series published. These were all studies that uh, included at least 30 patients. Many of these were retrospective, but there were prospective studies as well. Now, this is a graph depicting the median survival reported in these studies. These little squares show the median survival reported in palliative care studies. Not surprisingly, from 1982 through the 2000s, the natural history of this disease has not changed. The median survival is, rel is generally six to 10 months. These are all studies including 30 or more patients 
involving chemotherapy, and there are a variety of agents used. And I recognize this is not a meta-analysis, and this is subject to the bias of reported literature. But you see the survival is fairly constant over the decades. These green, tri these green triangles represent all studies, including 30 or more patients, involving surgery-based multimodality therapy. If you use your imagination, you may see a trend towards improvement. Now, the next two slides will show you <coughs> studies that actually split data by cell type. Malignant pleural mesothelioma is a little bit like, non, like lung cancer in the sense that there are two major histologies. In lung cancer, we talk about non-small cell lung cancer, the more common type, and its more aggressive and uh, more morbid counterpart, small cell lung cancer. These are two different diseases. Most researchers would not combine the two. And mesothelioma has a counterpart in the form of epithelial histology. That's the more favorable histology and the more commonly seen histology versus non-epithelial histology. These diseases behave so differently, and I will show you slides uh, depicting that, that they really should be described separately. And there are many series that have done that. These purple pentagons represent the chemotherapy trials that <coughs> describe data for patients with epithelial or the more favorable cell type. And these represent the surgical series that did the same. This is a study by DePerot up in Toronto. It's a bit of an outlier. This is actually a select subset. But generally speaking, there is some hint that patients with epithelial histology may benefit from surgical therapy. Now, as I mentioned, 30 years ago, everyone died. And many still carry a nihilistic attitude towards malignant pleural mesothelioma and argue that surgery is simply useless, that this is, we shouldn't even be discussing surgery for this disease. And so I looked at all series by, um, by some notable people and reported the, and looked at the five-year survival reported in those series. And we see the range is 9 to 27 percent. In surgery-based treatment, uh, this includes two types of surgery, uh, surgical techniques that I will describe. To put that in the context of diseases with which most of the people in this audience are more familiar, it kind of resembles pancreatic cancer. And there are many sim similarities from a tumor biology perspective and a multimodality therapy perspective. But the point is, pleural mesothelioma is on the map. Now there are survivors, and I believe much of that may be attributable to surgery-based therapy, but this is a controversial subject. So how do we improve survival in this very challenging disease? First is to refine the treatment. If you knock everyone off, like in that series that Bouchard published in 76, people aren't going to survive the disease. But the second part of that is to refine patient selection, and I'll discuss both of these. So the goal of surgery in, in malignant pleural mesothelioma is to optimize cytoreduction. We talk about, uh, this is a term coined by Dave Sugarbaker, macroscopic complete resection. This is different than the R0 resection most people in this room are used to describing and attaining. We don't get microscopically negative margins when we resect this disease. I mean, this is a disease of the pleural lining. It's essentially carcinomatosis by definition. But this gross resection disease, no visible disease, can be obtained with two different techniques. One is pleurectomy decortication. That's removal of the lining of the lung, the parietal and visceral pleura, sometimes the, the pericardium, sometimes the diaphragm, depending on extent of disease. And then there's the extrapleural pneumonectomy. That's the same, but includes removal of the entire lung. And generally with EPP, or extrapleural pneumonectomy, the pericardium and diaphragm are taken as well. Now, over the years, many surgeons and, uh, and others have worked towards refining that technique and reducing the perioperative mortality and morbidity. The first extrapleural pneumonectomy was actually de uh, developed, 
performed and the technique was developed and described here at Mount Sinai by Dr. Surratt. Uh, Seaview Hospital, just for a little tangent and historical note, was a tuberculosis sanitarium located where else but in Staten Island. It's currently a, an historical landmark. This was a technique used to treat tuberculosis. It's since closed, by the way. I, I'm sure you've noticed we don't usually treat TB with surgery. Um, but as Dr. Ostis described, Surratt was a Sinai surgeon. Now fast forward uh, approximately 34 years, uh, a little more actually. Um, in 1976, Eric Buchart of England was the first person to describe the use of extrapleural pneumonectomy in the treatment of mesothelioma. And he single-handedly turned the entire country of England against surgery for mesothelioma, and this uh, viewpoint persists to today. In this series of 29 patients, he had a 31% perioperative mortality. Can you imagine consenting your patients and telling them there's a one in three chance that they won't make it out of the hospital? And that's where this graph I showed earlier comes from, and a big part of not only why there's a nihilistic attitude towards this disease in England, but also why the technique was abandoned for at least a decade. Now, many people have worked in the subsequent decades to improve that technique, as well as another that I will describe, pleurectomy decortication. Uh, you should know that these three series were all published in the same journal. This is another tangent. But there's only one first author that was worthy of having his picture taken and put. <laughs> And, and, and just knowing the players, there's a reason for that. <laughs> so the technique for extrapleural pneumonectomy and pleurectomy decortication is actually somewhat similar, um, other than the whole removal of lung thing, but starts with a, an extended posterior lateral thoracotomy. Some of these slides you may have seen before. We remove the sixth rib, and we start dissecting the extrapleural space. When it's clean and the whole extrapleural dissection has been completed, this is a left-sided resection. You can see the uh, distal arch and the descending aorta. It's beautiful anatomy, a little bloody, but beautiful. On the right side, anteriorly, as the lung is retracted posteriorly, you can see the cava, the trachea, the pericardium. Residents who have scrubbed for these cases, I, I think, really enjoy seeing this anatomy, this is actually one of the reasons I went into surgery in general, was the anatomy of the chest, obviously and thoracic in particular. Posteriorly, when the lungs retracted, anteriorly on the right side, you see the sympathetics and, and they get kind of stunned, we'll say, with this operation. Many of our residents and fellows have seen the vasoplegia that results from this, epidural or no epidural, many of them are hypotensive for a few days postoperatively. Now this I call the gentleman's technique of uh, dissecting the diaphragmatic pleura or even the diaphragm itself. Uh, so the diaphragmatic pleura off the diaphragm or the diaphragm itself off the peritoneum. This is uh, the cob. In, in Boston, this is how I learned how to do it. You just stick your paw in there and you just rip the diaphragm off the chest wall, basically. And that's only if the diaphragm is involved with disease. Um, Dr. Flores and I both believe that it is, uh, behooves the patient to preserve the diaphragm if at all possible. They do seem to breathe better postoperatively. Now this is, this is tumor. This is actually a fairly low volume disease on the lung itself, but the next part of the operation, if you're going to proceed with pleurectomy decortication, is internal decortication or the visceral pleurectomy. And it's a little bit like peeling the skin off of a tomato. It's not really a plane that's supposed to exist. It's a little messy. The tomato looks like dog meat underneath. But you can remove bulky disease well into the fissures. And this is something Dr. Flores taught me. Where I trained, I'll be honest, when disease involved the fissures, we just took the lung out. Um, but I have since refined my technique based on Dr. Flores' teaching and I've been able to remove bulky disease with pleurectomy as well. And there's the specimen. 
kind of hard to stage that. Um, the pathologists can't stand it. I don't know what's up, what's down. But if we are going to proceed with extrapleural pneumonectomy, that is, if tumor involves the lung parenchyma itself, the per pericardium is going to go. We enter the pericardium anteriorly. We take the right pulmonary artery is taken intrapericardially. The left is taken extrapericardially. That's because the left intrapericardial PA is very short. And the veins are taken intrapericardially. And here they are divided, as is the bronchus. And here we've removed the pericardium, as well as the diaphragm. And this requires reconstruction because there is no lung to keep the liver from herniating into the chest. This is what it looks like in real life. This is the extra pleural pneumonectomy specimen, a little easier to stage, and I'll allude to that later when I describe my data. Here we now have the pericardium. This is removed intact. We have the diaphragmatic uh, surface, including the tendon, and you can see where, where it abutted the aorta. It's really beautiful anatomy. Ugly disease, beautiful anatomy. <clears throat> to reconstruct the diaphragm, I used two sheets of, uh, of a two millimeter Gore-Tex. And uh, it's not shown here, but I actually use a TA stapler to staple them together. And that gives a little flexibility so it's not to put it on tension. This is the surface that abuts the heart. Looks a little like a kidney bean. And here it is um, in situ. I use interrupted stitches. This is, the, uh, this is actually the endofascial suture device that uh, Carter Thompson pulled the stitches through with that. And uh, I learned this from Dr. Sugarbaker. Um, tie them down over Gore-Tex buttons so they don't pull through about two interspaces below uh, the exposed rib. So here we have the patch in place. And here we are sewing in the pericardial patch. I use interrupted stitches again. And then we fenestrate it to prevent tamponade. And here both patches in place, the reconstruction complete. And then we cover that bronchial stump. Um, if the diaphragm is removed, you can bring up a pedicle of uh, omentum to cover that, otherwise some thymic fat or whatever you can find to help buttress that. The remainder of this talk is going to be discussing refining patient selection. I admit not everyone needs surgery, not everyone should have surgery, but figuring out who those people are who benefit from surgery has been the subject of my research and, and going forward what I'd like to help delineate. So in 2011, we published a series up in Boston in uh, the European Journal of Cardiothoracic Surgery describing all patients who survived at least three years after surgery or after extrapleural pneumonectomy for mesothelioma. I actually called this long-term survival and the reviewers panned it. They, they didn't think that three years was long-term for mesothelioma, I would argue it is, but there you are. So we looked at all patients who survived at least three years to see how they differed from those who didn't in terms of clinical demographic uh, factors. The idea is to figure out who we should operate on. So all patients who had surgery, who had extra pleural pneumonectomy between 1988 and 2007, and looked at their complete preoperative data, including labs, and that will be uh, relevant in a minute. The reason we chose extra pleural pneumonectomy only is for that reason I, I showed you that picture of the specimen. The most complete staging is obtained from an extra pleural pneumonectomy specimen. So you know you're comparing apples to apples, oranges to oranges, if you're looking at those uh, specimens. For the patients who survived at least three years, we looked more closely at their uh, perioperative morbidity, staging, and survival. And the groups differed on many fronts. The, uh, I'm going to call them long-term survivors because the reviewers aren't in this audience, I don't think. Um, the long-term survivors were younger, were more likely to be women, more commonly had epithelial disease, as we would expect based on what I told you earlier, and more commonly had normal labs preoperatively. The purpose of this slide is just to show you that the long-term survivors included 
patients with advanced stage disease. Staging a mesothelioma is, not surprisingly, also controversial. There are multiple staging systems. There is one that has been abandoned, uh, the Bouchart system we rarely use. There was a Brigham system in 1999 and a later revised system. There's, of course, the AJCC TNM or IMIG staging system. No matter what staging system you used, you can see that there were some advanced stage disease patients who had surgery and went on to live. Looking at the morbidity, I can tell you, having taken care of these patients for at least half a decade now, these are all the usual suspects in terms of postoperative complications and the usual rates. The concept being that postoperative morbidity did not prohibit long-term survival. And here's the overall survival for the entire group. The reason for the flat part of the curve, as, as you may have guessed, is because we only included patients who survived at least three years. But importantly, if they survived at least three years, there was about a 50% chance they would survive about five years. It's a long time in mesothelioma. The other major finding of this paper, and that has driven me to my current research, was looking at the differences between men and women. 59 was the median age for, for the groups, and dichotomizing around that median age, we see that older and younger men have the same survival. Yet, older and younger women differ substantially. We'll come back to that, but what we see here is that there's something to being a young woman that, uh, that facilitates long-term survival in this disease. And the findings, as I had stated, if you live 50, if you live at least three years, there's about a 50% chance of living five years, that young women are disproportionately represented in these long-term survival uh, survivors, that pro perioperative morbidity does not prohibit long-term survival, and the young age female gender epithelial histology and normal labs were the predictors of better survival. Now, that, this is that graph I showed you a few slides back, superimposed and uh, placed on the same scale. So these are younger and older men and older women. Their survival is very similar. This line are the, uh, the, represents the younger women. So the role of gender in survival in mesothelioma and the uh, role of, gen of female gender in particular as a positive prognosticator for long-term survival has been intermittently reported in the literature. Here's an old uh, Dana-Farber series by Karen Antman. Here's an Italian registry series. And this was a multi-center trial in the 80s uh, and early 90s by the CALGB. This chart comes from Herndon's paper showing that of the 16 studies at that time, only four of them reported female gender as a positive prognosticator for long-term survival. And only these parentheses represent ones that withstood multivariable analysis. So I looked at this issue more closely in the Brigham data. And this series was published in 2010 in the uh, Annals of Thoracic Surgery. There were, at that time, uh, 2,100 patients in the patient registry, 715 of whom underwent extrapleural pneumonectomy. And we chose 2008 as an endpoint to allow for follow-up. And again, chose extrapleural pneumonectomy to allow for complete staging uh, just for the purpose of research. There were about 13 patients missing data, and they were not included in analysis. As I had mentioned earlier, given the difference in tumor biology for epithelial and non-epithelial disease, I chose to stratify the analysis um, accordingly. And these are the 450 patients with epithelial disease. And we can see women were younger, less likely to be anemic, 
and interestingly, more likely to have thrombocytosis, which is actually a negative prognosticator. For non-epithelial disease, patients had fewer differences. Um, in fact, only the hematocrit was different between the genders. The stages were actually fairly similar, so it's not that women are presenting at a younger stage, I mean at an earlier stage, pardon me. Now this is the overall survival for patients with epithelial disease, and as you can see here, the survival for women is better. When stratified by stage, these green and purple curves represent the women, the blue and red represent the men. They simply do better. Now for patients with non-epithelial disease, there's no difference. And similarly, when we stratify by stage, still no difference. The thought being that non-epithelial disease is such a negative prognosticator for long-term survival, even the effect of gender is not uh, seen in those patients. So the, on univariate analysis, all predictors except for side uh, were predictive of survival. And female gender, age, and normal labs and stage were still significantly predictive of long-term survival. And on Cox proportional hazard adjusted analysis, the hazard ratio for long-term mortality for women was 0.75. We'll just keep that number in mind for a minute. I'll bring, it, bring us back to it. For patients with non-epithelial disease, female gender fell out of uh, significance, and on multivariable analysis, only stage, normal white count, and normal platelet count were predictive of long-term survival. So the conclusions from that study were that female gender conferred a 25% survival advantage in epithelial malignant pleural mesothelioma that the independent predictors for survival in epithelial disease were female gender, young age, early stage, and normal labs. Whereas for non-epithelial disease, only stage, white blood cell count, and platelet count being normal were predictive of long-term survival. Now this is hot off the presses. Uh, we're presenting this at the Society of Thoracic Surgeons in, June, in January. This is looking at 14,000 SEER patients. Um, and you can see here, these are about 3,200 women, and these are 11,000 men, but there's, there's a difference in survival. Interestingly, on multivariable analysis, the hazard ratio for female gender for all comers, we don't know the cell type of these patients. I can tell you that epithelial disease is more common. Um, but we don't have a reported histology in the SEER database. But that hazard ratio is very similar to what we found in the, in the Brigham data. So what are the implications? If women are only 20% of patients with meso, who cares? Well, that's going to change. Um, Julian Petto gave me this slide. He's an epidemiologist at the London School of Hygiene who studies asbestos-related diseases, and he is best known for his uh, m decades of modeling uh, patterns of asbestos-related disease, and particularly mesothelioma, and, and fairly accurately predicted, predicting um, the numbers of patients we're going to see with this disease. Now, meso has about a 40-year latency period, so even though asbestos has been banned for years, a, we're still seeing patients who were exposed to it 40 years ago, and B, as Dr. Flores has presented in some of his talks, the asbestos is still out there. there there's a, is a, Canada has been continuing to export it. There are third world countries that continue to, um, to use it. So the point is, these are the number of women um, expected to die from malignant pleural mesothelioma. Now, in terms of other thoracic malignancies, 
there seems to be a role of gender as well, and this is a whole can of worms that I'm not going to have time to go into, and I myself am just beginning to explore. Um, but this is uh, one with Nevesky's study in the Journal of Clinical Oncology, and this is for non-small cell lung cancer. Women have better survival than men given every form of treatment, surgery, radiation, chemotherapy, and even no treatment at all. So there's something to this. Uh, there are maybe differences in the types of exposure or the response to exposure, the tumor biology itself, and the response to treatment, both in mesothelioma and perhaps other thoracic malignancies, as I've shown uh, there. Can we exploit these differences and help both women and men? I will admit, in the later years of my time in Boston, we were actually prescribing Premarin to men with mesothelioma in advanced disease. Not scientific, but we thought there was something to circulating estrogen having a role in, uh, in that difference in young women and the disproportionate number of young women we were seeing among long-term survivors. So in summary, malignant pleural mesothelioma, mesothelioma has come a long way from no long-term survivors to a 15%, approximately 15% five-year survival with surgery-based therapy. Surgical macroscopic resection can be accomplished with less morbid surgery, with pleurectomy decortication, and many of us have turned toward uh, doing this operation preferentially when feasible, pleurectomy decortication, even in bulky disease. Further impact on improving survival in this disease is going to depend on advances in individualizing therapy and, and individualizing treatment. And this is just a little cartoon. With the right tools, you can accomplish anything. I'm still trying to figure out if I'm the bear with the coat hanger or the tourist with the four-wheel drive SUV. Thank you guys for your attention, and I welcome any questions.